At around 8.20 a.m. on the morning of April 19, 1995, Florence Rogers, CEO of Federal Employees Credit Union, gathered with some of her employees for a morning meeting. She'd brought in some vacation photos from a cruise she'd taken the week before to show to her co-workers at the meeting. Quote, I'd turn around and look back at my computer screen at the next item we were to discuss. I'd rear back in my chair and let them chat about who's going to copy this and who's going to do this, get this ready for the banking department so they could hurry with their audit. She had just turned around in her chair and was rearing back in her chair, getting ready to discuss the next item, when there was the sound of an explosion and she was thrown to the ground. After the sound of the explosion, there was an eerie silence, but for the sound of shattering glass and fluttering papers. Quote, All the girls that were in the office with me disappeared. I thought they had ran out and left me alone. I started hollering, where are you guys? Where are you guys? Then realization set in somewhat, and I realized, I don't know where they are. They are gone. Eventually, I found out that when the bomb went up and everything started coming down, the seven floors above us had took them down into what was eventually known as the pit. I had been thrown on the floor and packed into my spot with stuff packed around me, I found out later that there was only 18 inches of exterior wall that did not break away, which kind of helped me there. My desk was sitting at an angle, ready to topple over into this hole that the bomb had made where all my employees had landed. Welcome back to Respect the Dead, the podcast where we don't. That's scary. Yeah. That was very scary. <laughs> I'm scared. <laughs> Welcome back to Respect the Dead. I'm Hoots. I'm Kaylin. And I'm Andy. Today we're going to talk about Timothy McVeigh and the Oklahoma City bombing. Uh, Respect the Dead always comes with sort of a general content warning because we often talk about terrible people. It sure does. But yep. today, <laughs> so there's just like a general like don't don't listen if if you're not ready to hear about some bad stuff. Listener discretion advised. <laughs> general, don't yeah, listen. Don't listen to our but podcast. Don't. <laughs> this is a warning. Don't. See your loved ones. <laughs> <laughs> but today's episode comes with a special content warning. This is going to be one of our darker ones. We're going to be talking about the American white supremacist movement, cults, child abuse, three different mass killings, all of which include child deaths, and parts of our discussion are going to be quite graphic. I'll cut out what I feel is unnecessary, but I also feel like it's important to bear witness to these tragedies, their survivors, and their victims. So some of the gruesome stuff we are, we are going to talk about. Um, so if you want to skip this one, skip it, and we'll be back with something funnier next week. Okay, bye. So we're- bye. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> See you later, home fry. <laughs> Are you guys ready? <laughs> no. <laughs> really not, but go ahead. Um, as ready as I imagine I'm going to be, I probably <laughs> shouldn't have smoked that extra joint. <laughs> like, I've, Yeah, I don't know. I, think I should have <laughs> smoked a joint before this. I'll send you my high vibes. I guess it depends on Please. if you smoked an indica <laughs> or a sativa. I don't know weed types. Those are beautiful names. <laughs> oh my God, for twins? <laughs> yes, for twin I was girls? About to say. <laughs> indica no, and twin- sativa? Twin boy and twin girl, indica and sativa Aww. is like gorgeous. Very Maybe cute. indico or sativo to give it a little like <gasps> yeah. European flair. Sounds a little Italian. Ooh, the O. I like that. Sounds are sexy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. To talk about Timothy McVeigh, okay. I first need to tell you about a few other dead guys. So this episode is going to be like a respect the dead Matryoshka doll. There's like a worm feast within a worm feast within a worm feast in this one. I love it. <laughs> oh, there's another asshole. We'll put up the next one. Oh, there's yeah. another asshole. <laughs> this is just my grinder messages and I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so the first of the three men we're going to talk about is a man named William Luther Pierce. 
William Luther Pierce III was an American white supremacist born in Atlanta, Georgia on September 11th, never forget, 1933. (laughs) The worst thing that's ever happened on September 11th. (laughs) On his mother's side, Pierce boasted a racist pedigree of Old South aristocracy, including being a direct descendant of the Attorney General of the Confederate States of America. So racism was kind of in his blood (sighs) and probably in his life since birth. He was his legacy. Yeah. Yeah. But his political activism really started in the early 1960s when he was working as an assistant professor of physics at Oregon State University. This was the time of the civil rights movement, 1960s counterculture, and early second wave feminism. Pierce, a racist, regarded all of these, as well as the later Vietnam War protests, as the machinations of the Jews. Of course. (laughs) Classic racist stuff. In 1962, he became involved with the far-right ultra-conservative think tank, the John Birch Society, but left because they weren't racist enough. Yeah. And if that name sounds familiar, um, you probably recognize it from my Phyllis Schlafly episode. It's like a... Mm -hmm. If there's like an MCU, like a cinematic universe of like right wing yeah. shit bags, like the John Birch Society is like at the center of that. It's whatever the the place where all the Avengers gather. I don't watch Marvel movies. <laughs> um, they have come up in like nine video research that I've nine videos that I've researched about homophobia and racism <laughs> like they just like their name is just like constantly there it's it's like so they're always showing up in the after credit sequences yeah i was gonna say like <laughs> yeah. at the end of every episode of season one you see like some random link to the john birch society and you don't find out what they are until the season finale yeah in 1965 he resigned from teaching and worked for a time at an aerospace manufacturer's laboratory in new haven connecticut as a way to finance his political projects which as far as i can tell were to be an intellectual vanguard for white supremacy um I, I didn't see anything that suggested he ever wanted to like run for office or anything like that. Uh, I think he really wanted to be the vanguard of white supremacy. I think he probably recognized that you can't hold a um, like political office, like being explicitly white supremacist, but he could push the message as like um, an intellectual, like a, a public intellectual, basically. Yeah. So eventually he made his way to Washington, D.C., where he became involved with the founder of the American Nazi Party, George Lincoln Rockwell, and Pierce became the editor of the American Nazi Party's quarterly journal, National Socialist World. Not them having a quarterly journal. Like, that's like... So, <laughs> no, that's, it's like so... They got a little magazine. <laughs> and they, like, they're, they're making their little zine. I'm just imagining, like, a room... You know in... In like old timey movies when they show like a, a room full of journalists and they're all typing at their little typewriters and smoking cigarettes. I'm imagining that, but with a bunch of people wearing white hoods. Yeah. And it's basically that. Oh, that would be very warm. Mm. Especially in Washington, D.C. It gets yeah. humid down there. Right. Oof. So William Luther Pierce was never really concerned with getting caught saying the quiet part out loud. <laughs> like my boy was shouting the quiet <laughs> part from the rooftops. He was literally editing National Socialist World. <laughs> <laughs> George Lincoln Rockwell, subject of a future episode, was blessedly murdered by another American Nazi in 1967. Aww. And Pierce took over his role as leader to the National Socialist White People's Party, which was what the American Nazi Party was going by those days. They'd have like a little <laughs> a little rebrand. <laughs> the White People's Party. <laughs> the White People's Party. Pierce left the NSWPP after a time <laughs> and attached oh, himself. Oh, LGBTQ is ridiculous, but NSWPP <laughs> is is fine. They've got nothing. Right? To, they've got no leg to stand on when it comes to fucking the Alphabet Brigade. NSWPP. <laughs> like, you reuse the P once. God, I'm begging you to throw a vowel in there, right? <laughs> Can I get an I, please? 
<laughs> vowels are for leftists and gays. Vowels are for communists. <laughs> <laughs> Constance only for racists. He left the White People's Party after a time and attached himself to a political organization supporting the presidential candidacy of a far right governor from Alabama before cannibalizing that organization and oh. creating from it a far right political group known as the National Youth Alliance in 1970. I really thought we were taking a hard turn into him eating the governor. <laughs> It's a full cannibalism. <laughs> yeah, no, he's not that kind of shithead. Okay. <laughs> By 1971, Pierce was openly feuding with the National Youth Alliance's co-founder, Willis Carto. And like, I just, just as like a sidebar, it's really refreshing to read about the right eating itself. Because, you know, we always hear about, about the left say, eating itself. But Finally, mm-hmm. some rightist infighting. I know. I love it. <laughs> I, I love to see it. Just like I'm, I'm standing above all those crabs in a barrel like, yes, fight, fight. <laughs> Looks like that crab is getting higher in the barrel than you. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody watch out. <laughs> oh shit, I dropped a knife in there. Now what's going to happen? <laughs> <laughs> Not arming the crabs. <laughs> I mean the crabs. <laughs> We're going to arm the crabs. I just made weaponry available to them. A bunch of tiny little knives dropped into the pot just to spice things up. Let's see what happens. I'm just curious. I'm sorry. That was like some very – that was some very American reasoning, Mandy. Like I didn't actually arm the insurgents. I just (laughs) scattered some weapons at home. guns near them. I can't believe they'd ever turn against us. (laughs) What? Me, 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 re- uh, me sewing. Fuck yeah, me reaping. <laughs> I just <laughs> happened to gift them some weapons, and they just happened yeah. to gift me some money. Yeah, that's all. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so after a time, the National Youth Alliance split into two wings, with Pierce's wing branching off into its own independent organization, the National Alliance, in 1974. So they dropped the youth part. <laughs> They were getting a little crusty. Yeah, they were getting older. <laughs> you can't really call yourself the Youth Alliance when you're 37. Yeah. <laughs> You've never <laughs> worn sunscreen in your life. Yeah. <laughs> Which you think that they would. Yeah, they love being white. You think they would be like SPF 80. <laughs> yeah. Pierce's little plan for the National Alliance was for it to be the vanguard party that would eventually bring about the white nationalist overthrow of the U.S. government, the creation of an all-white homeland, and a genocide of the Jews. So, No, thank you. He had big dreams, and they were all bad. This party sounds like it sucks. <laughs> I want to go yes. home. Daddy, can you come pick <laughs> me up? Not a fan. I thought it was a party, <laughs> but it's a, like something about white people, and they're really bad. <laughs> I'm really uncomfortable. (laughs) I just want to come home and eat cereal and go to bed. It said it was a white people party, so I thought I was invited and things are getting really weird. In 1975, Pierce begins publishing a serial story in the National Alliance's official newspaper called The Turner Diaries. The the story is called The Turner Diaries, not not the newspaper. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) <laughs> Pierce published the Turner Diaries as a novel under the pen name Andrew McDonald in 1978. And since then, it has been one of the most influential pieces of far-right agitprop, being cited as the inspiration for around 40 terror attacks and hate crimes in various manifestos. So like almost Jesus. without fail, when somebody goes on a mass shooting or a bombing uh, or even mm-hmm. just stab somebody and they leave behind a manifesto, like usually... this gets a little mention. Have you read it? Uh, I have not. Um, It's actually pretty hard to get a hold of. Um, In uh, in the US, it's not banned. Uh, In Canada, it's banned. Good. Um, But uh, (laughs) several, like Amazon had it for sale for years, but it's taken it down. Like it's very hard. You would basically have to like Google a PDF and I'm sure there's like free PDFs online. I... (laughs) God. to, To like... I'm not against reading it. Sure, yeah. Like for a project, um, but like to 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 do that kind of like psych to 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 have that kind of like psychic damage inflicted upon myself. Yeah, um, I'd yeah. have to have like a reason to do. Oh, it. Oh yeah, one hundred. Yeah, yeah. That's not something you just like tiptoe into lately. I was just wondering if you ended up having to do that for this. For this, um, no. Yeah. 
Um, okay. Because I know, I know, like the basic um, gotcha. you know, synopsis of it. Okay, um, gotcha. But to actually like sit down and read it, I would. Um, I'm not against that, but I, I don't want to. I don't want to inflict that upon myself. <laughs> yeah, than this fucking podcast. <laughs> Fair. Have you guys seen like four channels and like four far right wing Twitter accounts referencing the day of the row? Yes, yes, I yes. have, and I I know a little bit about it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's from the Turner Diaries. Um, it's okay. It's okay. Specifically, like okay. yep. within the events of the novel, there's like a mass lynching. Right. So, like when people on the right reference the Day of the Rope, they're specifically referencing a scene from the Turner okay. Diaries. Okay. Okay. All right. I. I. All right. Yeah, I think I have heard about this then. Mm-hmm. Gross. Yeah. The Turner Diaries is a piece of speculative fiction presented as the journal of a right-wing insurgent named Earl Turner, who works with a far-right terror cell called The Organization and an elite neo-Nazi group called The Order to overthrow the United States federal government and instigate a race war. And, like, you're you're supposed to sympathize with Earl and The Organization and The Order. But, like, if you're supposed to sympathize with them, why do you name them, like, things like The Organization and The Order? Like, those are very, like, scary-sounding names. It it literally sounds like a Star Wars villain. Yeah. It does. The First Order. Yes, and they are not that good at at naming things in ominous ways. If this was real, The Organization would have been, like, the (laughs) O-D-L-P-P. Or something like that. like The Organization for the Advancement of White People. <laughs> Ew, p- p- oh, sorry. Advancement starts with a vowel. Sort of, they don't like vowels. Don't. Get that out of here. Get that shit out of here. At the end of his story, Earl Turner martyrs himself for the cause of white supremacy by flying a crop duster full of nuclear warheads at the Pentagon. <laughs> Which is <laughs> very us. funny. Okay, buddy. <laughs> it's very funny. <laughs> That's just like super nice. <laughs> 11. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's 9, 12, oh and God. 13. <laughs> like, well, I guess this all takes place in the future, but it's very funny to me that you could load <laughs> nuclear warheads onto a crop yeah. duster. <laughs> like, this is written by somebody who's ever seen a crop duster. <laughs> Or a nuclear warhead. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Which, like, I'm glad he had never seen a nuclear warhead. <laughs> but, like, <laughs> this is so good. Okay. This is I love like it's clearly like I again I haven't read it um but like it feels like clearly the crop duster was chosen over like a commercial air aircraft because like you know uh, fascist iconography right. yeah the, the, the working like fascist class. iconography likes to harken back they like to harken back to agrarian imagery. Yeah. So he's yeah. like, I'm using a crop duster. Sticking it to the government. Me driving you know, to the where... fucking White House with a bazooka strapped to a tractor. Like, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to get so you. Funny. It's so funny. <laughs> I'm going to get you, old bummer. Just slowly driving a tractor. <laughs> Those things max out at like 10 <laughs> miles per hour. <laughs> They'd have a lot of time to stop him. <laughs> Wait, okay. Total sidebar. But have you guys heard the song, She Thinks My Tractor is Sex? Yes, Yes. unfortunately, yes. Great song. Love that song. (laughs) Anyway, there's a framing device in the prologue and epilogue written from the year of 2099 that assures us that uh, not only were Earl Turner's actions good and successful, but that after his death, the organization managed to take over the world and purge the earth of non-white people. Mm. The epilogue ends with, quote, just 110 years after the birth of the Great One, meaning Adolf Hitler. The dream of a white world finally became a certainty, and the order would spread its wise and benevolent rule over the earth for all time to come. And again, this is meant to be a positive, galvanizing ending, not like a horrific, chilling, dystopian ending. Well, say that's what it sounds terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like literally one of the most terrifying sentences yeah, I've ever heard. Genocide. To normal people, <laughs> this end. sounds like yeah, it sounds like 1984. This it sounds, sounds like bad. The Handmaid's Tale, like, but it's not. Yeah. It's meant to be like we were successful, we won. Like now, go out and do it in the real world. Yeah. So one of the reasons the Turner Diaries has been so inspiring to so many violent far-right extremists is because it shows how these small terror cells are able to terrorize institutions and systems. He, he actually refers to the federal government throughout the book as the system uh, through various specific acts of violence, small-scale bombings, lynchings. And while it isn't a tactical manual, a lot of killers have tried to emulate scenes from the book. 
Oh, good. Yeah. William Luther Pierce would go on to publish another racist novel to advance the cause of white supremacy, a 1989 novel called Hunter about a guy who hunts down mixed race couples. And again, you are supposed to sympathize with that guy and not the people <sighs> he's killing. It sounds like it sounds like the it sounds like a, a horror movie. Like it sounds like mm-hmm. that would be the villain in a horror movie. But no, it's supposed to be like that guy is right and good. Yeah. And the people he's murdering are wrong. Yeah, because like I could see um a work of fiction doing something like that and having it be kind of an interesting conversation or having interesting points mm-hmm. as but when it's like if the point of the book is actually no, this would be a good thing if it happens or if it does happen, it is happening, um, then you know, obviously that's a big fucking problem. <laughs> yeah. I also don't think at any point I would want to watch a movie or read a book like that that was written by a white person. Oh, no, no. Oh, absolutely not. If it's supposed to be like a social commentary and it's like Sarah Silverman or something. (laughs) Right. Like if Jordan Peele made this movie, I fucking would watch it 100%. But I don't think he would. (laughs) Yeah, I was going to say, it sounds like somebody trying to do like a knockoff Jordan Peele horror. Yeah. Um, Except... It's it's not. Yeah. Art is always about the framing. Yep. Uh, Context. So Hunter wasn't as influential or as damaging as the Turner Diaries. Pierce would also go on to found a quasi-religion called Cosmotheism that was almost certainly just a ploy to get the National Alliance tax-exempt status as a religious organization. The old Enron Hubbard maneuver. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. It was it was a it was a grift. Surprising absolutely no one, Pierce was also a piece of shit in his personal life. He was you married. Don't say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he was married five times, his first four marriages ending Jesus. in divorce because he was profoundly abusive. Mm-hmm. Can you imagine like being able to hold up your entire hand and going, I was married this many times? <laughs> yeah. I, I, I almost it. I almost completed a, a Henry VIII set, but I yeah. died first. <laughs> He was on his way. I got married four times, and the fifth one was just thrown in for free. I want a lot of like one day weddings and divorces. You, uh, you want to do a lot of uh, <laughs> drive through Vegas weddings that get annulled like six days later? Yeah, just because it'd be really funny to be like, you want Brittany at it? Yeah, just mm-hmm. to be able to like drop in conversation. Like my fourth ex husband It's just there's there's, <laughs> there's like something really iconic. gorgeous about that. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like you'd really pull off the the widow look too, Kaylin. Like the big hat, the black smoking when they come to talk to you about what your exes are. <laughs> You're literally just describing death becomes her. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, am. I feel like you'd look really good with like a hole in the middle of your stomach. <laughs> I already have the spray paint make it down, so <laughs> maybe your neck it was twisted around backwards. <laughs> to quote an article in the guardian about his son from his first marriage calvin pierce quote calvin's strongest memories of his dad involve abuse any disobedience or perception of bad behavior led to beatings with whatever was at hand a belt a wire hanger a two by four the violence left calvin with bruises and a deep well of self-loathing Kelvin was raised to be a bigot like his father, but did a 180 when he went to college at Virginia Tech and met other students who were non-white and realized that they were not, in fact, subhuman monsters, but just normal people. And his relationship with his father became very estranged after that. Good for him. Yeah. At Kelvin's wedding in 1986, William Pierce gave his son a box of nine millimeter bullets as a wedding gift. Kelvin didn't even own a gun. Jeez. Yeah, he fucking sucked. Fuck and God. William Luther Pierce died of kidney failure in 2002 at the age of 68. Mm. He didn't live as long as many of the worm feasts on this show, but tragically, he did live long enough to see the proliferation of his Turner Diaries among the extreme right and the fruits of his labor, including the worst domestic terror attack in United States history. Which brings us first... To our next dead Nazi, a man named Robert J. Matthews. I do love that all the Nazis we talk about are dead. That is nice. Me too. And it just it makes it a little easier to stomach when the Nazi you're talking about is a dead I Nazi. Like, 
I wish they were. Oh, wait. <laughs> they are. <laughs> Never mind. And you know what? Uh, we, we've we already passed our one that's going to live the longest. None of them is going to. None of them is going to die old, and that's also good news. Gorgeous. Uh, okay, so Bob Matthews also got his political start in the John Birch Society at the tender age of 11. He was raised Methodist, but rebaptized in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints at the age of 19. Hey, Mormons. Yeah, our old friends, the Momos. <laughs> <laughs> the Momos. That's definitely a slur, but I think we can say it. <laughs> the M slur. <laughs> and like Bob had hobbies. He formed a cute little club called the Sons of Liberty that was an armed anti-communist militia, mostly made up of Mormon survivalists. And he committed tax fraud in his spare time. <laughs> like you do. Yeah. Hobbies. Hobbies. So he got arrested for trying to claim just boy stuff. <laughs> just boy stuff. Militias, <laughs> boys tax being fraud. Boys. <laughs> <laughs> just boys being boys. He got arrested for trying to claim 10 dependents on his W tax form and <laughs> placed on probation for six months. Honestly, I think that's Wait, fucking he's hilarious. <laughs> How, what was that? <laughs> He got arrested for putting 10 dependents oh, on his tax okay. form. When he was like 20. Dependents. Okay. <laughs> I, I thought you said he was 20 and unmarried. And he was like, yeah, I got I got 10 dependents. Okay. For some reason, I thought you were saying like the word independence, but 10 dependents. And I was like, what the fuck? No. I was so confused. Okay. 10 dependents. Ten dependents. <laughs> okay. Honestly, I think that's hilarious and iconic. Yeah, no, that's great. Yeah. Like, <laughs> we don't stand him. We don't we stand do not him stand. because he's a Nazi. We do not stand a Nazi. But also, like, but I appreciate Appreciate I love the hustle. <laughs> Me putting every bottle of my nail polish down as yeah. independent. <laughs> <laughs> putting their names in, like, after school boy blazer and licorice. <laughs> I do love it when people have the audacity. Like the name of a sitcom, you know, except it'd be about a guy named Ted, so it'd be called Ted Dependent or something. Oh. Ew. This sounds like... I wouldn't watch ew. it. Something, yeah. <laughs> so he got placed on probation for six months for that. In 1974, his probation ended and he moved to Washington State, where he would eventually meet and marry his wife and also try to recruit people in the Pacific Northwest to the American Nazi cause and advocate for the PNW to become a white separatist stronghold called the White American Bastion. I, they really need, they're like, okay, we don't know what we're going to call it, but we need to have the word white in there. <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's like our whole thing <laughs> we really need to have that front yeah. center you know so bob becomes a full outspoken white supremacist around 1982 and he's a big fan of a little book called the turner the diaries. diaries oh no their titles are so close you don't say <laughs> 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 he gives a speech at the National Alliance Convention in 1983, and in September of that same year, along with eight other men, including active members of the Aryan Nations and the National Alliance, forms an organization, really more like a crime syndicate, called The Order, after the neo-Nazi group from the Turner Diaries. <laughs> I was like, where have I heard those two words in that order today? The order order. But okay, gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> Taking their cue from the Turner Diaries, the order began trying to raise money for their um, for their terrorist activities by doing a bunch of armed robberies and counterfeiting. Were they any good? Well, the counterfeiting is what really fucked them up. Like, pro tip, okay. don't try to counterfeit money. <laughs> I was about to say, like, that is very <laughs> difficult. And <laughs> like it is a it is so toxic of them to be like, oh no, we could totally do this. Like we'll get away with yeah. this. Like, I'm sorry, but And this is the early 80s, so they're doing yeah. that shit by hand. They're doing it by hand crank. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, but Nazis are like not exactly known for their creativity. Mm, yeah, that's hard. I learned that from the movie Good uh, the TV show Good Girls. My friend Good Girls did the same thing. <laughs> Christina Hendricks. <laughs> My good friend. She told me how hard it was. Uh, so two of their members were arrested for trying to pass off fake bills. <laughs> and one of them agreed to become an FBI informant. 
no <laughs> fucking allegiance <laughs> whatsoever. Never. <laughs> These are the most backstabby <laughs> bitches. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, you can't trust white supremacists? What? <laughs> yeah, you can't like these this is not the Italian mafia who care about family. Like yeah. white supremacists are backstabby little little <laughs> bitches. <laughs> The search for Bob Matthews becomes one of the largest manhunts in FBI history at the time. And in his final days, Bob would write a letter declaring war on the United States federal government, <laughs> just like in his okay. favorite book, The Turner Diaries. <laughs> it's such a funny thing for an individual just person wait to wait get a call. Oh my God. <laughs> like, I declare war on the United <laughs> States government. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they just reply At, back new phone who dis <laughs> like like and what are you gonna do about it okay <laughs> like, question mark. and then what you stupid bitch like, can, can you tell me the next step because first you declare war and then you're supposed to go to Dying. war you don't just like you don't just like run into like a random town hall and be like i declare war <laughs> like then what i put a bullet between your it's eyes like, right. <laughs> like, Bam, like okay problem solved. i won <laughs> like one guy is not a, a fucking like Calvary I declare with war. This is gorgeous. Yeah. I mean, like, <laughs> if the I white love when men are stupid. <laughs> if the white supremacy <laughs> wasn't enough to like clue you in to the fact that he's fucking delusional. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> the level of Delulu to like be like to, I want to know who in the government he wrote it to too. <laughs> like it was like, damn Mr. President. But it got to like the <laughs> Secretary of Transportation or something. <laughs> We're just like, um, okay. We got to put this in the declare war pile. <laughs> There's just like a little pile. It has like a little name on a plaque that's just like it, like next to another stack that's like, you know, like people declarations of war. Fix their, their roads. Like. Oh, my God. By the end of 1984, Matthews and his accomplices had all hidden themselves away in safe houses. But the FBI tracked Bob down to a house near Freeland, Washington, after he dropped a pistol while robbing a Brinks armored truck. <laughs> this stupid bitch. Okay. This stupid okay. bitch. Out of all the trucks to rob. A Brinks truck. You pick the one with the highest security with people specifically trained right. to deal with being robbed. Highly trained. Why don't, and then yeah, you drop your go gun. Fucking, and then you drop you your drop gun it. at the scene of the crime, you dumb bitch. <laughs> Let me just drop this gun with all this DNA evidence oh. on it and a note that says belongs to. <laughs> oh. <laughs> His name was written on the like washing instructions tag of the gun. <laughs> Property of, <laughs> please return to with his address. Like also his diary, <laughs> where it has like the page at the front that tells you where to return it to. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> oh, there's like little black suns <laughs> dotting the eyes. <laughs> <laughs> All the X's. <laughs> oh no, the X's look like swastikas. <laughs> oh, and he's writing in white oh, gel no. pen, so you can't really read it that well. Oh, no. oh wait, but like white gel pen on like a black gun would really pop. <laughs> <laughs> it would really pop. <laughs> Not all the boys down at the like Pete. P, 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 who are like decorating their guns <laughs> together on a Sunday night. <laughs> Crap. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like glitter, like glitter and feathers. <laughs> but the feathers. <laughs> the colorful craft <laughs> feathers. The glue stick. <laughs> I want to add a pipe cleaner to the end of my oh. sniper rifle. Oh my God. A little pipe cleaner, <sighs> like ring around the nozzle would be so cute. Oh my God. It makes it quiet. <laughs> no, not a pipe <laughs> cleaner silencer. Uh, making fun of Nazis is so fun. And they find this gun. <laughs> <laughs> the police find this gun and they're like, what the hell is even that? <laughs> like, <laughs> what the hell is even oh that? Oh my goodness. Okay. Oh, I'm dying. <sighs> <sighs> 
The FBI had Bob's safe house surrounded on December 7th. <laughs> the F- <laughs> <laughs> they're, like, they're like, hey, is this your gun? <laughs> hey, buddy, you found your gun. Is this your sparkly gun? <laughs> we followed the map on your gun back here. We, actually, we just followed the glitter. It was very easy to find you. <laughs> A trail of like glitter, like fucking those those horrible colored craft feathers that look like they have alopecia. Oh my god, yes. It was like three little strands like, on them. Yeah. Pink and purple and <laughs> yeah. nasty looking, yeah. <laughs> the FBI attempted to negotiate a surrender with Bob until December 8th when he refused to talk to them anymore and they fired us. Wait, how many days was this? Like a day. They tried to like negotiate okay, okay. for a day without killing him. Um Okay. Uh, until he refused to talk anymore and they fired a stun grenade out and dozens of uh, smoke grenades and like they threw dozens of smoke grenades into the house in order to force him out but that <laughs> didn't work because Bob had a gas a mask out? because he was literally a oh. fucking prepper like <laughs> so he just put on his mask was. of course he was <laughs> he sits there <laughs> you're so fucking clever <laughs> <laughs> and his mask is covered in the feathers. Yeah, the mask is also bejeweled. There's like the eyes on it. <laughs> Bob responded by opening fire on the FBI agents. And over the, <laughs> over the next several hours, Bob and the FBI exchanged gunfire in which no FBI agents were hurt. <laughs> so his, his aim leaves something to be desired. Um, I... Like I'm okay with mm. everyone in the story dying. Like, <laughs> so but, real everyone sucks okay. your situation, but yeah. the Nazis suck Quest. the most. Well, obviously, yeah. But like, question: mm-hmm. Say he did take out some FBI agents. Does he think they don't have more? Because like <laughs> he's alone, but they have like thousands and police right and, like, okay he's by can himself. call in hundreds of thousands mm-hmm. of people to surround him if they really wanted to to that i will like- say uh <laughs> white supremacists um all fascists uh want to die uh like oh gotcha it's it's a death cult like and you want and the murderer the idea is to have a heroic death yeah gotcha yeah okay. being a martyr is like a big thing yeah yeah 100 yeah. percent. i mean especially if he was inspired by the turner diaries considering they the the book literally ends with that one guy <laughs> fucking suiciding himself into the Venicon. Like, yeah, His it makes sense. Snoopy plane. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that it like the actual ideology of, of fascism is like pretty amorphous, but across the board, like a desire for a heroic death uh, and a young death is like is is pretty part and parcel to it. So like he fully expects to die and he wants to be he wants to go down for the white supremacist cause. If they want to die. That's okay. <laughs> like I'm okay. like if they want to die and die young, then like be my guest. The problem is um, they want to die. Probably not in a plane with nuclear bombs on the way to a place in the United States, yeah. but like or taking out people or death by cop or whatever. But like, yeah, I guess they don't just want to die. They want they want the glory. Right. They want the glory. They, they, they want to die yeah. while causing as much devastation as possible basically so like it's one thing to self-destruct it's another thing to like explode (laughs) you know yeah the siege lasted until an agent fired three flares from a grenade launcher (laughs) into the house (laughs) didn't have his flare mask on (laughs) (laughs) setting off the grenade the 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 flares hit some of Bob's stockpile of hand grenades and ammunition. <laughs> <laughs> okay, his face in the, like when he turns and realizes must have been so cartoony. <laughs> Well, oh, it doesn't look right at the camera. <laughs> it doesn't explode, oh. but the house does catch on fire. Okay. Um, and Bob continued exchanging fire with agents as the house around him burned, firing off Jesus. more than a thousand rounds oh, at Jesus. federal agents, hitting none of them. <laughs> Those are hilarious odds. Uh, and t- <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> until oh he succumbed God, to smoke inhalation and burns. Like the FBI agents who were there at the time were like, they describe it as like there's all the sound of like the guns <laughs> going off, and then suddenly it just stops. Like the man just like passed out in the middle of firing. Uh, he was 31 years old, 
As I said, no federal agents were hurt or killed in the standoff with Bob Matthews, but as a result of his actions and the mayhem and violence perpetrated by the order, the FBI was on high alert. It could have been much worse for them. And in the late 1980s and into the 1990s, domestic terrorism perpetrated by neo-Nazis was in the agency's crosshairs. Can I just say, it's it's this is like... If I didn't know anything about this guy and just heard this about the story of the shootout, I'd be like, oh, he was white. Like, I wouldn't have even needed to know know that because, like, the fact that it took they, – they were willing to negotiate him for a day. And the fact that he died from smoke him- himmelation and um, burns, you know what I mean? Like, they weren't the ones that went in there guns blazing mm-hmm. and killed him. Like – I don't know. This whole story, there, there's a part of me that's in the back of my head right now that's going like, yeah, obviously he was white because they actually made the effort to try and see if they could actually, you know, capture him alive. Um, yeah, some of this story is going to seem kind of pro uh, law enforcement. And oh, yeah, no, no, we are not. We are <laughs> an not <laughs> podcast here. Um, it's just a thought. I uh, and I'm I'm yeah, I'm going to I'm going to say some things later on. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we'll yeah. get to it. Sorry, we'll that was just it. a random thought I had yeah. listening to all this, where I'm like, yeah, this dude was definitely white because they went through so much trouble. Like anybody else, they would have just been like, oh yeah, shoot him in the fucking head immediately. <laughs> like, yeah. Elsewhere in the Pacific Northwest, in a small town in northern Idaho, a former U.S. Army soldier, Randy Weaver, and his wife Vicky secured themselves twenty acres in a cabin to raise their children away from what Vicky saw to be a corrupt world. Vicky was an apocalyptic Christian who believed that the end times were imminent. And Vicky and Randy really just sort of wanted to raise their family in the middle of the woods away from the modern world. Uh, They even visited with the Amish to like learn how to live without modern electricity. Now, Vicky and Randy and their kids weren't the only people to settle in the little town of Ruby Ridge, Idaho. The Aryan nations were also there too. So. Randy gets into a land dispute with one of his neighbors, and his neighbor loses a lawsuit to him. So the neighbor, a guy named Terry Kinnison, basically writes a letter to the FBI and the Secret Service like, hey, like this guy, I just lost a court case and have to pay $2,000 plus damages to keep saying he's going to like kill President Ronald Reagan and also the Pope. And also he's probably involved with these skinheads in the area. Okay, bye. So... The FBI are like, well, we have to look into this. <laughs> he threatened the president a- and the Pope. So in January of 1985, a month after they firebombed that Nazi Bob Matthews, the FBI launches an investigation into Randy Weaver. The FBI basically finds that Randy and Vicki Weaver aren't like full-blown members of the Aryan Nations. Like they attended the odd meeting here and there, and they were friends with several of the members, but they disagreed with them on some of their positions and declined several invitations to join. You know, they were like just really putting the casual back in casual racism. <laughs> the FBI doesn't file any charges against the Weavers, and both Randy and Vicky basically file an affidavit saying that their enemies were trying to get the FBI to kill them by saying they were threatening the president. Like, Terry Kinnison was basically engaging in an early version of swatting. swatting yeah. Yeah. Um, which, which might be true. Um, who knows? Who cares? Uh, like, I literally don't care if somebody's threatening Reagan and the Pope, like some <laughs> random guy in Idaho. Right. <laughs> and Randy Weaver even goes so far as to write a personal letter to Ronald Reagan, alleging as much. He's like, look, bro, we're cool. I, I'm not going to kill you. <laughs> I, I declare not war. I declare not. <laughs> yeah. What's that word called? I'm doing uh, the opposite. Uh, unwar. I declare yes. <laughs> unwar. 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 But this is where our good buddies at the ATF come into the picture. So for the Kalins in the audience, Thank you. the ATF is the United States Bureau <laughs> of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. What a weird little mix. Yeah. And also cute names for triplets. <laughs> <laughs> alcohol, tobacco, and firearms. <laughs> we have a bureau for all the things we do at parties. The kill? In July 1986, the ATF becomes aware of Randy when he was introduced to a confidential ATF informant at a meeting at the World Aryan Congress. Again, 
Randy isn't a full-fledged member of the Aryan Nations. He just hangs out with them and goes to their parties and shares most of their opinions. <laughs> the ATF informant introduces himself to Randy as a skinhead who sells weapons to motorcycle gangs and over the next three years earns Randy's trust and meets with him several times. So at some point in this three-year period, the ATF informant convinces Randy to sell him some sawed-off shotguns. Sawed-off shotguns are one of one of the only kinds of firearms that are tightly controlled in the U.S. And the idea was to arrest Randy for selling illegal weapons and then yeah. to offer him a deal to act as an informant against members of the Aryan Nations. Now, back back to back to being a cab. Randy was a racist piece of shit, but I don't think it's a very controversial opinion to say that that was kind of entrapment. Yeah, like yeah grooming a guy for three years and asking him if he'd sell you his his like friendly acquaintance a sawed off shotgun without a permit like i would sell illegal weapons to you guys like because i'm a good friend yeah exactly yeah <laughs> randy refused to become an informant and in december of 1990 he was indicted for making and possessing illegal firearms but not for selling them again because he was kind of entrapped yeah. that the ATF did a fucked up yeah. thing. The American legal system is long and arduous, so eventually Randy Weaver's court date is set for the beginning of Pisces season and my third birthday, mm -hmm. February 20th, 1992. Oh my god. Yeah. Happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you. I was three. I was living my best life. It was all downhill from there. <laughs> Randy decides he doesn't want to do that. He doesn't want to go to court. Uh, so he doesn't appear for his court date. <laughs> and a bench warrant is issued for this. his arrest. <laughs> He's like, it's just not my vibe. I don't really like it. Uh, I just wasn't feeling... Courty. That was just like, like vibes. <laughs> yeah. For that, just... It was a Tuesday. And on Tuesdays, I usually watch Reba at home. Mm. And like, I don't know. I just wasn't feeling it. It was like a little This is muddy cutting into my manifestation time. Um. <laughs> So a bench warrant is issued for Randy's arrest, and things really go downhill from there. The case is transferred from the ATF to the U.S. Marshals Service, who give him a month's grace period to show up in court, after which they come to pick him up at his house. <laughs> the marshals spend around the next seven months trying to negotiate with Randy and get him to leave his home and to surrender peacefully. Again, like, he's not actually... Um, being accused of any kind of violent crime, so they're taking their time with him. All he did was saw off some shotguns. Um, yeah. This entire time, the marshals are also surveilling the area and the Weaver family. Randy was a former army soldier, but he lied to a bunch of people he met and bragged about being a former Green Beret. So the marshals get this <laughs> intel and they think they're dealing with a much more highly trained, much more dangerous former soldier than they actually were. Yeah. Uh, let me see. A memo that passed around the Justice Department read, quote, the assumptions of federal and some state and local law enforcement personnel about Weaver, that he was a Green Beret, that he would shoot on sight anyone who attempted to arrest him that he had collected certain types of arms, that he had booby-trapped and tunneled his property, exaggerated the threat he posed. <laughs> here's, where shit, here's where shit gets really weird. In April of 1992, while the United States Marshal Service was setting up surveillance cameras overlooking the Weaver property, they received reports that Randy Weaver fired shots at a helicopter being chartered by journalist and TV personality Geraldo Rivera flying over his property while filming a TV show. Oh, shit. <laughs> now, okay. Rivera's helicopter pilot, Richard Weiss, testified that no shots had been fired. But Assistant U.S. Attorney Ron Howen would later claim that shots were fired at the Rivera helicopter and this would constitute an overt act against the government. Yeah. So yeah. probably didn't happen. Yeah. Again, we're... This is our... This is their excuse to go in, yes. right? Yes. We're getting deep into the okay. ACAB part. Like, everyone sucks here, right? Like, I, I don't the like the guy who's sympathetic to Nazis. Yeah. Don't really care if he yeah. dies. Uh, but the government <laughs> are uh, being uh, being shitheads. Yeah, they're being the government. Yeah. 
which is an opinion of mine that I hold that overlaps with a lot of far right people, sadly, um, in, in this case in particular. Yeah, don't don't snack on me. On August 21st, 1992, six marshals were sent to scout the area to determine suitable places away from the cabin to apprehend and arrest Randy Weaver. At the Weaver residence on that day were Randy and Vicki Weaver, a family friend named Kevin Harris, and Randy and Vicki's four children. Sarah, who was 16, Sammy, who was 14, Rachel, who was 10, and Ella Sheba, who was 10 months. How the firefight started that day has been the subject of very heated debate for the last 30 years, but allegedly... 14-year-old Sammy and Kevin, the family friend, are out walking around the property with one of their dogs, a golden retriever, who either goes after one of the federal agents or the federal agent shoots shoots the dog preemptively. But either way, a federal agent kills the dog. Mm-hmm. Jesus. And the 14-year-old boy goes nuts and starts screaming, you've killed my dog, you son of a bitch. And allegedly, Sammy and Kevin open fire on the federal agents, although a lot of people sympathetic to the Weavers believe that the feds fired first. In the firefight, Kevin kills a federal agent, Deputy U.S. Marshal William Francis Deegan, and Sammy Weaver, who, remember, is a child is killed while retreating up a hill, shot in the back. Jesus. Following the gunfight on August 21st, the U.S. Marshals received support from Idaho law enforcement and the FBI's hostage team, and an 11-day standoff ensues on the Weaver property. Every law enforcement agency has rules of engagement, standard operating procedures for when to engage in deadly force. Across the board, this includes a surrender warning in which a combatant is to be given a chance to surrender before engaging in force. Now, whether whether this part of the rules of engagement is actually honored within a given law enforcement agency is certainly up for debate. But as far as what the standard operating procedures are supposed to be, the surrender warning is, is in there. Now, the FBI and the U.S. Marshal Service believe that they might be dealing with another Bob Matthews situation, except with an entire family of Bob Matthews instead of just one guy. So for maybe the first time in FBI history, the rules of engagement are specially rewritten for the Ruby Ridge standoff. The federal agents are basically told that the surrender warning has already been given so to open fire on any armed adult they lay eyes on. These rules of engagement would later be criticized by the U.S. Senate as virtual shoot-on-site orders, because that's kind of what they were. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What else could it possibly be? Like, this is... Yeah. Okay. And they're saying very specifically on adults, but they've already shot two children, right? A child. You can't tell... One Who child. An adult okay, is. sorry. They've they've shot one child. They've killed one child. Okay. And they were shooting at an adult man and a child. The adult man okay. um has killed a US Marshal. Yeah. So there's and two dads, a child. One on each yeah. side of the standoff. But one of them is a child, a 14 year old. From a distance, can you tell the difference between a 14 year old and a 25 year old? I mean, I probably no. can't. I can't tell ages anyway. So Yeah. So it's basically like anybody over fi- five feet tall is is yeah. fair game. Fuck. On the afternoon of August 22nd, snipers are dispatched to Weaver's cabin. Randy, Kevin, and Randy's 16-year-old daughter, Sarah, leave the cabin to check on Sammy Weaver's body, and one of the agents opens fire on them as they retreat. Randy is hit in the back with a bullet on his way back to the cabin, and another bullet passes through Kevin Harris and hits Vicki Weaver, standing in the doorway of the cabin, directly in the face as she's holding her 10-month-old daughter, Elisheba. Oh, my God. Overnight, a crowd of skinheads and Aryan Nations members had gathered at the roadblock outside the Weaver property, and the news of Sammy and Vicki Weaver's deaths ignited new waves of fury. Right-wing extremists latched onto this immediately. Of course they did. The Weavers were ultimately a family of pretty random racists who just wanted to live in complete isolation in the woods, and they probably weren't committed enough to the cause of racism to ever become terrorists or violent extremists themselves. And the way the ATF and the U.S. Marshal Service and the FBI botched the siege on Ruby Ridge, killing a child and a mother with a baby in her arms, 
gave neo-Nazis like former KKK Grand Wizard Louis Beam a rallying cry. The Weavers were religious, and they had lots of guns, and the far right would spin the story of the siege on Ruby Ridge into a story about the government coming after religion and guns in order to radicalize the more moderate right. Religion and guns are their favorite. Yeah. Yeah. And this is where a lot of this talking point among the moderate right comes for, from and where a lot of the um, paranoia around it comes from, is specifically yeah. Ruby Ridge. So is this mm-hmm. um, this whole like people are, are killing Christians thing, is, was that inflamed by this? Because that's something I see yeah. quite a bit. Okay. This whole story, um, which is a, going to be a two-parter, <laughs> BT dubs, uh, is the genesis of both the American militia movement um, and eventually, it's a two-parter, it's two two-parters, because uh, I'm going to get <laughs> on to another story related to this okay. after I finish this two-parter. But uh, basically, there's two branches. I'm talking about the beginning of the American militia movement and the beginning of the um, of public mass shootings in, in like the modern era. Gotcha, okay. And... Uh, a lot of the uh, the paranoia that has been seeded on the quote unquote more moderate right that has been um, pushing the more moderate right uh, to more extreme positions has come from like this period in the early 1990s. Right. Yeah. Following Ruby Ridge, Lewis Beam would exclaim that now is the time for you as an individual to commit overt acts of anti-government violence. Essentially, anybody representative of government or law enforcement was a fair and reasonable target. Now, that is very different from today, but um, yeah. the far right was 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 calling for um, mm, yeah. members of the public to um, target members of law enforcement. The standoff at Ruby Ridge was ultimately resolved on August 30th, 1992, when hostage negotiator Bo Gritz convinced Randy Weaver to surrender in order to get Kevin Harris the hospital care he needed. Basically, Kevin Harris had reached a point because he um, the bullet that hit Vicky Weaver had passed through his chest and he was still alive. But he was like begging Randy Weaver to kill him, to put him out of his misery. And Bo Gritz also like they also have his teenage son's body in there. And mm-hmm. Gritz is like, let's He's end done. this now. You can take yeah. your you can take your son yeah, to he's... be cremated or buried or whatever, and we can get yeah. Kevin the hospital care that he needs because he's going to die soon. Yeah. Um, Harris lives, and he was ultimately acquitted of all charges. Uh, and Randy Weaver was acquitted for all except the charge for missing his initial court date for which he was convicted and served 16 of his 18 month sentence. Randy Weaver died in May of last year. So actually I think he was like 70. So he's the oldest one who dies today. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, The siege on Ruby Ridge was the kindling that started the fire of the budding America militia movement, but it wasn't enough just yet for it to fully combust. That event would come six months later. The Branch Davidians are an apocalyptic cult founded, <laughs> yeah, they an are. apocalyptic Christian cult uh, <laughs> founded in 1955 as an offshoot of uh, the Davidians, who are an offshoot of Seventh Day Adventists. Mm-hmm. Fucking the Christian cinematic universe is just always spiraling <laughs> out, isn't it? And it's CCU. Just, and it's like cults and, and branches of cults all the way down. Mm hmm. The Branch Davidians settled on a hilltop east of Waco, Texas, that they named Mount Carmel. Christian cults and cults, kind of in general, really, uh, hit their stride in the late mid-century, especially in the 1970s, as like a more traditionalist expression of kind of like post-hippie culture, which is why you hear of so many fucking cults from the like late 70s. Like, people talk about religious cults in the 1970s the way they're gonna talk about wellness cults in the 2010s and the 20s like like nexium yeah or crossfit by 1981 a sex offender by the name of vernon howell moved into the branch davidian community at mount carmel and started trying to take over 
And by sex offender, I mean that he impregnated a 15-year-old when he was 19 and got kicked out of his previous church for asking the pastor to give him his 12-year-old daughter as a wife. Jesus. Yeah. No. No, 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 no. Yeah. No. No, At Mount you. Carmel, Howell starts claiming the gift of prophecy, as they always fucking do, <laughs> <laughs> and saying that there's going to be an Armageddon. You know, I was just thinking, what is the story missing? <laughs> and saying that there's going to be an Armageddon. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, there yeah. it is. Oh, of, of, of course. course. God says I'm special, and also that the world is ending, so... I love this song. You know, better just do whatever I say. <laughs> I knew this one. He garnered a following among the Branch Davidians and claimed that he would achieve martyrdom, establishing a Davidic kingdom in Jerusalem. Uh, Mm -hmm. He had an arch nemesis in the church, which honestly I think is kind of iconic. Like, I wish I had an arch nemesis. Um, Of course. And he had to take his followers to Palestine, Texas for a little while. Uh, But then his arch nemesis... (laughs) murdered someone with an axe and was sentenced to confinement in an insane asylum, you know, just like girl stuff. In Arkham? <laughs> like, what? Yeah, the story is way too long to get into the weeds of that because it's not really related, but like it has to be an episode one day. <laughs> that's that's bonkers. It's cuckoo for Cocoa why. Puffs. <laughs> so, <laughs> as you do when your arch nemesis gets in, <laughs> confined in an insane asylum for murdering someone with an axe, Howell and his followers return to their yeah. base in Mount Carmel. He was like, guess I won. <laughs> <laughs> Vernon Howell has been through a lot at this point. So, he decides it's time for a little rebrand. And in 1990, he changes his name to David Koresh. The Branch Davidians were a Christian cult who believed in the apocalypse from Revelations was imminent, and as apocalyptic Christians are wont to do, they stockpiled a ton of illegal weapons. Mm -hmm. Around May of 1992, the Waco Sheriff's Department got a report from a UPS truck driver about a shipment to Mount Carmel. Uh, There was a box that fell apart and some pineapple (laughs) grenades fell out. (laughs) And the ATF was like, whoopsie (laughs) dipsy, maybe we should look into this cult buying all these fucking grenades. (laughs) (laughs) Just like through UPS. I'm also picturing them as like, like a little like cute little like <laughs> literally shaped and painted like pineapples and you have to like pull the like stem off oh my God, instead that would be of so pulling cute. a pin out. Uh, for, for anybody who doesn't know right. pineapple grenades are literally those ones that you see like in movies and tv the like little handheld it's the bumpy ones yeah it's right? the little bumpy one they're called yeah. that because and they're almost shaped like a pineapple and, yeah yeah um so he just like was ordering a few boxes of those from ups <laughs> <laughs> or via ups <laughs> Koresh constantly preached that the Branch Davidians were going to be met with opposing force, and the ATF worried that if no force came, David Koresh would do something to try to prompt it. So, you know, you know, like hurry it along a little bit. That's always their worst fear with these uh, Christian cults. So I guess the ATF decided to show force like it's kind of a lose-lose situation <laughs> like yeah uh but they decided to be the first aggressors the raid on the branch davidian complex in waco texas began on february 28th 1993 a reporter accidentally tipped off one of the branch davidians so david koresh and his <laughs> 150 followers were armed and ready for federal agents and open fired on them when oh, they arrived how Literally, many 150 jesus christ some of them were kids, so I assume like you know, like probably like eighty yeah. or ninety adults. Those grenade arms aren't aren't that great when you're a baby. Yeah, <laughs> it would like the story was literally that like a reporter drove up in his fucking car and like rolled down his windshield and was like, "Hey, I'm looking for the the raid. I heard there's gonna be a raid." <laughs> and the bridge Davidian oh was like, "Really? <laughs> ah, that would be me, one hundred percent, or Ronnie, or something like that." <laughs> a gunfight ensued for the next two hours over which four ATF agents were killed and at least one branch Davidian was killed. During a ceasefire, David Koresh would claim that several of his children had been killed as well as other members of the the Davidians. 
An additional 14 federal agents were wounded in the February 28th firefight. American law enforcement had never come across this kind of resistance or this kind of loss before. So um, the FBI hostage team, fresh off of Ruby Ridge, is once again called in. And this time, they're willing to take as long as possible to negotiate and prevent any further casualties because there have already been quite a few. Starting the evening of February 28th, hostage negotiators started getting the Branch Davidians to release some of the children in the complex. To quote FBI hostage negotiator Byron Sage, quote, we were starting to get kids out, but we couldn't fathom how in the world these parents were so latched onto David that they would abandon their children. We took videotapes of them playing on the swing set and eating ice cream and just communing with one another, and we sent them back into the compound. We wanted to do something tangible so that their parents could think, maybe I need to come out and reassume my responsibility as a parent. David Koresh let all of the children go except for his own, which was around 25 children, and 70 adults remained in the compound. On March 2nd, the FBI hostage team agreed to broadcast David Koresh's message to the world if he would let his people go, and he recorded his message to the world for the FBI and then kept his people in the complex because, of course, he fucking did. Of course he did. (laughs) (laughs) He was like, okay, thanks. I will do. Mm -hmm. (laughs) A quote from Bob Ricks, FBI special agent in charge, quote, we were at such a high level thinking that this thing was going to end. We were almost high-fiving each other. Then all of a sudden, everything just stopped. We were told that David received a message from God telling him to wait. (laughs) (laughs) Of course he did. The FBI was pissed that they had been duped. So they went scorched earth. They went crazy X on the situation, like full Carrie Underwood before he cheats on the situation. They cut power to the compound. They put on floodlights at all hours of the day and night, uh, drove over Koresh's cars with tanks, (laughs) and they set up loudspeakers Oh, and Jesus. they began blasting Christmas carols, the sounds of dying rabbits, <gasps> phones off the hook, Tibetan monk chants, and Nancy Sinatra's These Boots Are Made for Walking <laughs> all through the night. I want to know which queen <laughs> chose that song. <laughs> I know. Right? <laughs> God. Do you know what rabbits dying sounds like, by horrible. the way? It is a terrible Why sound. Why do you know? It's horrible. <laughs> Kaylin's like, I'm literally vegan. <laughs> why, why do people know what that is? Because <laughs> I've watched movies. <laughs> oh, like rabbit snuff films? <laughs> <laughs> yes, Kaylin. I watched rabbit snuff films specifically. <laughs> it's definitely in some documentaries to try to turn you vegan. And uh, let me tell you, it works. It works. <laughs> See, I was thinking specifically of the movie Wild America, but oh, okay. <laughs> I, mean, all, oh. I guess there's that too. The full standoff lasted 51 days and received constant news coverage. This was like all people cared about. Mm -hmm. The same arm of the far right gathered in Waco to protest, as well as more moderate Americans who are being slowly radicalized by the messages being peddled by extremists on the heels of Ruby Ridge. Remember, this was only six months later. Yeah. People who weren't explicitly neo-Nazis were starting to think, like, yeah, maybe the government will come after me for my guns and for my pineapple grenade collecting hobby. (laughs) (laughs) The last adult comes out of the Branch Davidian complex on March 21st. The last child had come out on March 5th. In early March, the FBI had given David Koresh a video camera to use to communicate with them because they didn't have FaceTime back then. Yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, so he could like post to his Instagram story and show that like everything was chill inside and that he hadn't like killed all of his followers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in some of the videos, he shows his wives who are very, very young women and teenagers because David Koresh was, remember, a rapist. Yeah. After two months of negotiations, 
the FBI approaches Attorney General Janet Reno with an idea to basically use armored vehicles to punch holes into the side of the building, um, in the, the sides of the building where the Branch Davidians are gathered, and to pour tear gas inside the holes in order to force all of them out. Yeah. And Janet Reno refuses on the basis of, of this being um, fucking unhinged and inhumane. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. So the FBI shows her the video of the very young women David Koresh calls his wives, holding the children he's forced them to bear. And it's then that she allegedly approves the plan. The morning of April 19th, 1993, the federal agents carried out their plan. And while they were pumping tear gas into the building, several of the Branch Davidians were dumping fuel all over the floors of the complex. Around noon, three fires broke out, almost immediately engulfing the building. Footage of the blaze was captured by media, and audio from the compound was captured by the federal agent's bug, bug tapes. In some of the audio, you can hear the Branch Davidians talking about pouring out the fuel. To quote Byron Sage again, quote, as that fire continued to build, a few adults came out. One of them had jumped out of the second floor window, and then she started to run back into the fire. An agent started to run after her, went into the building, grabbed her, and pulled her out. She was ready to ignite. I mean, there was smoke trailing off of her clothes. Nine adults came out. Not one of them brought a child out. Seventy-six people died. Twenty-eight of them were children. In a PBS documentary after the fact, FBI special agent in charge Jeff Jamar said, the part that we played cannot be ignored. We provoked the circumstances, but David Koresh decided he was going to die. What happened was to serve his purpose. And that was the most devastating thing to me as I served his purpose to a terrible degree. The siege on Waco not only marked a turning point in the rise of the American militia movement, but it marked a pivotal moment in America's right-wing conspiracy movement. Echoes of the conspiracies that surrounded Waco could be felt in the later 9-11 conspiracies and QAnon. Like there's all kinds of like homemade documentaries saying that like everyone was trying to escape the building and the FBI opened fire on them. Um, that I mean, that's just not the case. Like we have lots of media footage of yeah. the- yeah. Don't look it up if you don't want to see that because um, it's horrible <laughs> yeah. to watch. No, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'll believe you. But there is there is a lot of footage uh, if you want to see it. There's a lot of documentaries about it, including this PBS one that I watched. About three miles from Mount Carmel, there was a hill with a rise just high enough that you could see into the Branch Davidian compound. This was as close as members of the public could get to the compound and where protesters, media, and rubberneckers would gather during the 51-day siege of Waco. Among them was a 24-year-old Army veteran selling bumper stickers with pro-gun, anti-government slogans. And that 24-year-old Army veteran is who we're going to talk about in part two, a man named Timothy McVeigh. You've been listening to Respect the Dead, the podcast where we don't... There are a couple ways to support us. Patreon supporters get bonuses like extended episodes with audio from the cutting room floor and adding cadavers to our suggestion cemetery. Leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and we might read it out on the show. Follow Respect the Dead on all platforms at underscore Respect the Dead. Thanks so much for listening. See you next Monday for another Worm Feast. I'm Kaylin Conrad. I'm Ailey Mandy. And I'm Hoots. Bye. Bye.